Okay, so I am Dr. Kim Godwin. I'm an instructional designer with MTSU Online. And today we're gonna to be talking about quizzes and it's an advanced quizzes conversation. Last week we did one on some basic quizzing and some general information about that. And hopefully I will get a chance here shortly to um, get that up uploaded and available for y'all. Um, and then I wanted to go ahead and tell you that we had initially planned to talk about submission views and uh, feedback and hints and things like that. Uh, we learned last week that this takes a little bit longer than we thought it would, and this one will probably take even longer. So in two weeks, we are actually going to do um, one on the 30th, specifically on submission views and um, the feedback options within questions and things like that. So um, if you have a lot of questions about that, if you wanna send them to us ahead of time, that'd be awesome. And we will make sure to touch on those when we get to that one in two weeks. But we have lots to talk about today and we might touch on some of that a little bit, but we wanted to let you know ahead of time. Um, so with me today, um, as always, as our best ever chat monitor is Tara Perrin. She's the other instructional designer for MTSU Online. Uh, so if you have questions throughout, uh, please feel free to stick those in the chat. She is amazing at monitoring the chat and making sure that I get in there and answer those questions uh, if there are things that we need to touch on. So um, before we go into the main part about quizzes, I want to um, go ahead and talk about some of the other events that are coming up through the LTN ITC. As I mentioned, we have one in uh, two weeks that Tara, Tara is leading and I'm going to be doing the chat. So that's kind of exciting. Um, and it's on submission views and feedback. Uh, and then next week, there is one uh, from the library um, that they are doing on scholarly identification tools. Uh, and then there's one next Friday on <laughs> Um, digital projects uh, through the Humanities Learning Center, I think, Learning Community, I think, or Learning Circle. Um, and then there's another one coming up next week on um, creating accessible content. So make sure that you are checking out the mtsu.edu stay on course faculty calendar for upcoming events um, and trainings that are available. So um, Without too much further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with y'all so that you can see what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so this is my one of my development shells. It is one that I get to play around in and mess around in. So we are going to use that today. And part of what I'm going to do today is walk you through uh, some of the more in-depth concepts with quizzes. Um, Last week, we talked a little bit about how to do the basics of setting one up. This week, we're going to actually talk about the question library and using question pools and some other intricate things like that, as well as the arithmetic questions. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, a couple of additional security restrictions, which, as it turns out, is very timely. Um, and then one that's come up pretty frequently that we are going to touch on, too, is if you need to reset an attempt for a student. Uh, how to do that. So uh, we're going to talk about a lot of those things today. Uh, but before we get started, I actually want to go ahead and touch on the the huge elephant that's in the room that we've been talking about, the, the cheating issue. Um, yeah, there are ways for people to cheat, whether that's face-to-face -face or online, um, and it does come down to personal decision. Um, one of the things outside of of just um, putting additional restrictions and creating question pools and doing things that are, are much more involved in terms of ensuring that students aren't getting the same tests um, is thinking about what it is that you want your tests to stand for and do. Um, so tests and quizzes, are they formative? Are they summative? Um, are we using them for students to take a look at, at where they are and, and what they're doing and how they're progressing through the class? Um, using that as an area for our own development as a faculty member to help get our students to the next level of engagement and help to get our students to a new level of uh, knowledge, understanding, and application. Um, are we doing our assessments at the end of a unit um, or at the end of a semester at the end of like midterm um, where we are asking them to 
remember specific facts or specific information. Um, thinking about our purpose, it's uh, it's one of the things that I like to think about with it is in, in the real world, um, outside of college um, or K-12 for that matter, um, we typically do not live in a vacuum that we are not able to use uh, resources, either uh, books, resources, uh, the internet, uh, people that we know, each other, faculty, uh, any of those things to help us um, if we get stuck on something. If we are asked a question and we're not sure of the exact answer, if we know where to go look it up, then we're expected to do that um, in the real world in our jobs. Um, so one of the things to think about with that is um, when we're thinking about creating assessments and we're thinking about creating our tests, are we creating our tests so that our students know how to find the information and apply the information? Or are our students taking the test in order to give us specific facts that later in life they may go look up? Um, so thinking about how we're structuring our tests and the purpose of our tests also kind of hits on that a little bit. Um, if we are okay at the beginning and how our test is structured um, with them using it as open note, open book, um, then uh, we don't tend to run into as many issues with that anyway. Um, and along that same path, you still know whether or not students are prepared for the test, um, even if it's open note, note or open book or any of those things um, because you put time limits on it and if a student has never watched any of your lectures um, has never read any of the books has never reviewed any of the resources they're not going to finish their test in the time allowed um, it's going to be pretty obvious they're going to be able to answer a few but they're going to run out of time because you just cannot look everything up in that amount of time that is available um, so really thinking about how we're assigning time to things, thinking about what the purpose of those uh, assessments are, what is it that we're actually trying to measure with our assessments. And when we're thinking about measuring with our assessments, that takes us back to um, our alignment of our student learning outcomes and our course objectives. Is the type of assessment that we're doing actually measuring what it is that we say that, that we want them to be learning in that module or in this course or in that semester. Um, so those are just kind of some, some broader things to think about in terms of creating quizzes and, and thinking about things like that is what is our purpose of this quiz? What are we hoping to obtain from this quiz? Uh, and what do we want our students to be able to show as a result of our quiz um, or exam or, or test? Um, so those are just a, a few concepts on that that I just kind of want y'all to, to think about in the back of your mind uh, as you are processing and, and making decisions about your assessments. So um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I would be more than happy for y'all to minimize me if you um, don't want Zoom as the primary thing on your screen and go ahead and open up a D2L course that you have. Um, and we will actually get in there and I am going to walk you through the process of creating a uh, question library area and how that leads to setting up question pools um, and arithmetic questions. So um, here I am. I am in my development shell. I'm sorry. Uh, are yes. you sharing screen? Because I don't see a screen share. Can, can y'all not see my screen? I see it. I can see it fine. Okay. All right. Sorry. Don't have a clue as to why I'm not. Thank you. It's okay. okay. Um, it can, if you, I'm not really sure. That's strange. Um, Check what view you're in. Maybe it's blocking it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so the way that we get to the question library is you go to assessments and then you go to quizzes. Did you just say for us to do, to pull? Yeah, feel free to come along with me. Do it, you can do it with me so that you are practicing at the same time that I'm showing you how to do it. So that if you run into questions or something doesn't make sense, you can ask us about it in real time while we're here. Are we going into your D2L development shell? Or You're going into one of your own classes. Okay. Kim, I, I do apologize. What helped to my students if they cannot see the shared screen, if you stop sharing and then restart sharing again. That usually helps to those who cannot see my shared screen with my students. Okay, I can do that. Share again. 
Did that fix it? I'm sorry, it did not. So right. <laughs> this is going to be meaningless to me. Bye-bye, folks. Okay, bye. Sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so in your own class, um, you've gone to assessment, you've gone to quiz, um, and you are now looking at this page. Yours is going to look a little bit different than mine. Um, but up here at the top, you should have manage quiz and then question library and then statistics. Question library is where we're going today. So if you want to click on the question library. Um, I have a little bit in my question library, not a whole lot um, because I, this is a development shell, so I don't have much in it. Um, but uh, this is where you will build your question libraries for exams. So um, the first thing that you're going to want to do in your question library is create a new section. So in higher education section has a very specific meaning. In D2L, the only thing that's called a section is in this. Um, it's a folder. It's not a new section. It's not a new class. It's not creating something crazy. It's just a folder. Um, it's the one thing in D2L that they're like, let's change the name just for fun. Um, so you're going to want to create a section and then you're going to want to label it whatever you want to label it as. So I would suggest labeling, labeling it as um, the class name or uh, exam one or something like that. That's a, a pretty big overarching term. Um, so we're going to call ours exam one. Um, and then one of the things that I like to do uh, within these is that I like to start my shuffling at the very beginning. Um, so as I put questions in, when things come out, they will shuffle as they come out. It's just one more step of shuffling. Um, it doesn't make a huge difference at this level if we're going to be using question pools, but it never hurts to have as many shuffles turned on as possible because it just adds more opportunities for everyone to get a different version of the test. And then I'm going to save. And I am so sorry that my dog is barking. I hope that it's not bothering y'all. Uh, so now we have exam one. We have a question, uh, a folder for exam one. And now we're going to go ahead and start entering some questions. So one thing to note at this point, um, and I'm, I'm not going to do this, but if somebody, if we need this down the road, uh, we can probably talk about it, but it's probably more specific to an individual case. If you have test banks and you are pulling those in, there are some very specific requirements, but you're <clears> probably <throat> going to pull them into your question library. Um, and so there's some really specific requirements about how to do that, but each of those publishers has that information available on their website. But if you ever have questions about that, let us know. Um, or check with Scott, because I saw him on here earlier, so we'll just kind of let him. Go for it, Scott. Um, so if you ever have questions about that, that you're going to do that there. So for exam one, we're going to go ahead and create some questions. So we're going to click new, and then we're going to select the type of question. So last week, we talked a little bit about true, false. We talked about multiple choice. We talked about multiple select. Um, we talked about written response, and we talked about short answer. Um, just to touch on those a little bit, uh, true, false. That was pretty straightforward. Multiple choice. If you create a multiple choice question, you can actually shuffle your answers as well in the question. So you can have your question and then put your answers in, and then you can have those shuffle in addition to your question shuffling. So no two people will get the same question or the same answers in the same order. Um, one thing to note on that, if you shuffle your multiple choice and you have all of the above or none of the above, it may not actually be above. So I would suggest changing that to all listed or none listed or something that's much more broad depending on where it ends up in the list. Uh, multiple select, it allows you to pick more than one answer as correct. Uh, so the example that I used was uh, about MTSU's colors and so you could select both blue and white. Um, and then written response are the ones that are more paragraph responses. Or if you are going to be putting in, um, students are going to be adding some text information like graphs or something like that that they've created that they're adding in um, that are more as images or things like that. Uh, you'll want to use that and make sure you turn on your HTML. And then the quick overview with short answer questions is, um, make sure that you type in all of the possible answers. So uh, it's, 
it's wrong if it's not exactly what it is that you typed in there. So just make sure that you put in all the answers that you'll accept. Um, so, but what we're going to actually hit on today, um, because we talked about that we would do this, is actually the arithmetic question. So I'm going to show you all about doing an arithmetic question. So an arithmetic question, um, we're just going to give it one quick one. Okay, so you know what, I'm just going to show it to y'all over here in my other development shell <laughs> instead, of, instead of doing it. Um, so in the quizzes, um, am I in the right one? I don't think I'm in the right one. I'm in two different places. Have y'all ever done that? <laughs> I am in two different places. Okay, so in this one, the, the part that you'll want to note um, in your formulas is um, you're going to use those squiggly brackets. Oops. So the squiggly brackets under your formula, uh, and we'll do the question here in a minute, but the squiggly brackets is where you are going to uh, be able to change the value of your questions. So um, they have an actual name, but I like squiggly brackets. So a squiggly bracket plus, oops, plus squiggly bracket B squiggly bracket. So what you're going to do with this is if it, once you type it in, test it. Oh, see, it's mad at me. And do you know why it's mad at me? Is because I didn't put anything down here. So down here in the variables is where we're going to put our specifics so that it varies this, and then you can test your formula. So I will allow mine to have a variance of, um, this is A, and my minimum is 1, and my maximum is 10. And I'm not going to worry about decimal points or steps. That Those all depend on your needs and what you need with those things. Uh, B. And I'm going to say 21 to 37. Um, so now that information is in there, and it shouldn't yell at me quite as hard, uh, but we'll see. What? What is it? Oh. Okay. So there you go. That is how you know that your formula works. Um, so it's... It's okay. It's because I didn't put all the extra steps in there. Um, but that is how you know that your formula works is when you run the formula. The most important part of that, of the arithmetic question, is thinking about your values. Now, one thing to note in here is that this, because it's a math one, it's arithmetic, that you would change your values based on math. You can actually use those squigglies to change other things. Uh, you can... Um, and some of the other questions, anywhere there's a variable, you can use that squiggly and change it. So if you are looking to have them create a graph or um, run some sort of um, accounting information or finance information, uh, you can actually change values uh, for anything uh, within those squigglies. It will pull the information that you put into the variables and pull it based on what you say is your range or what you say are your options. Um, so the reason that we wanted to show you that in the slightly more advanced one was because if you are asking the same mathematical questions for every single person, it does actually open the door for more options for people to be helping each other. Uh, but if you put ranges in like this one, that you have different variables, then it creates a different variable for every student. It self grades it, uh, as long as you do the allow automatic grading at the end, um, and then you do the step that allows it to export it. it. It will self grade, and it does it based on the numbers that it gave to the student. So you're not having to go in and override those. It will do that for you. It does that math for you and tells you whether or not it's accurate based on the information that it put in there. So if you have 30 people in your class and you have 10 values for A and 10 values for B, the chances of any two people getting um, the exact same numerical values within their quiz are tiny. And then within that, you've already shuffled your question order um, and we're actually going to pull things in as a question pool as well, which would create another level. Um, so 
it really just opens the door for you to be able to have as many different options as you possibly can on an assessment. If we were in a face-to-face -face class and we were creating multiple tests, we probably wouldn't create more than two, maybe three for our class um, because it's just a lot of time and a lot of work on your part. This one is an, an infinite number. I mean, like there's no, there's no end to how many you could put in there. You can put in as many variables as you want. The, the, mine has two variables, um, but if you wanted to, you could add additional variables. So depending on how involved you needed your equations to be, you would be able to put those in there. Um, so before we go past this one, um, does anybody have any questions about arithmetic questions before, before we do it? Before we move on i can see the chat popping around so i just want to make sure if anybody has any questions about arithmetic okay okay so hey kim i've got a question i was trying to get it in the chat box but so the regular brackets would still be mathematical functions correct like if you were going to add two numbers together and then divide by a third number mm -hmm. you'll use the regular brackets to mm -hmm. okay yep yes and then when, uh, when I click on the first squiggly bracket, do I get a, I get like two of them for some reason. It's real weird the way it's, is that just unique to my? But that's, or? yeah, that sounds okay. unique to okay. you. Sorry. sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so that is arithmetic. I know that it can seem kind of a, a little bit confusing. It is something that I encourage you to practice a couple times, um, test it a couple times, take a look at it. Um, see if you can figure out ways that make the most sense to you. Um, it is possible to do some copying, pasting of things in there. So uh, you can do some of that. Just think about how you want to do it and, and what you want to do with it and then practice it a couple times. Um, so back to our question library. Um, so uh, I didn't add any additional questions to that one, but um, within our question library, this now exists. Um, a section. I want to show you now how to use the question pool to create your quiz. So in order to do that, we're going to go, um, well, we can just be done. So we're done. I clicked the done over there to the far right side, or you can just go back to quizzes. It's totally fine. Uh, so within quizzes, we are going to create a new quiz. Um, and before we get too far into this, especially because I think some of you might be in active semester classes as you create this, before we go any further, go ahead and click on, oh, I, I do that every time. Um, go ahead and click on restriction and just make sure it should be. It automatically hides when you are creating a new one, but please make sure that it's hidden so that as you're creating this, it doesn't show up in your students panic in your class. Um, so just make sure that it is hidden from users so that you can play around in it and it not cause you an issue. So from the properties page, we already have a title. Um, and then we are gonna create quiz questions in order to create our question pool. Um, and the way that you do that is that you click on the add and edit questions and then when you come to this page and it's only blank like this if you don't have any questions but when you come to this page you're going to go to add and probably in the past you've created either a section within your test or you've created a new question that you've just clicked on this and picked the option that you wanted. We're going to play with question pool. So go ahead and click on question pool. And then we're going to name it and it's just going to be section one. And we are going to choose however many questions out of our section that we want to have. So say that we have 50 questions from chapter one that are available in our question library. Um, then we would choose, um, let's say we want 10. So we want 10 and we want each one of them to be worth two points. So on this, an important note, a little side note for you. If when you're creating your question library, you assign everything as a value of one, 
Um, then when you pull them into your question pools, you can change the values if you need to based on whatever's going on with your test or how many questions. You can change the values. Um, and that will allow you, if, if you change the values in your question library, it's harder to do this. And then you have to manually go in and change it. If everything in your question library is set as one, you can pull everything in and change your value and then change it in your quiz instead of your question library. So we're going to pull 10. Um, I don't know that I actually have a question library section that has 10 in it, but we're going to pull 10 from our question library. So when your question library comes up, uh, it will look similar to this. Our source is our question library. Um, it's over here in the top right hand side. You can click and see what some of your options are and break it down specifically um, as to what it is that that you want to pull from. So I have a whole lot in here as it turns out. Um, so we can pull from anything within our question library. So to give you a pretty good example, I'm gonna pull from this one. And there are 52 questions. I'm gonna pull from all 52. So I'm gonna select. And I now will pick 10 from 52. So what you saw happen there, um, if you are able to see my screen, what you saw happen there was that all of those questions showed up. There are actually 52 right here. And then this is randomly selecting 10 of the 52. Um, so this first person is getting these 10. And then if we click that, it actually shows us a different set of 10. So if we have a question pool set up, it will actually allow us to have multiple opportunities for students to see different questions. And when we're creating our questions, if we're also using um, replacement variables for replacement strings for variables, or we're using uh, multiple choice that we change the order, um, or even multiple select that you change the order, um, you are creating an endless number of opportunities for students to get different tests. Uh, so. Uh, I really encourage the use of the question library and how to do that. Uh, so I'm going to save it. I'm going to show you what that looks like in your test. And then we'll create another one because I'd love for y'all to be able to see how that works. Um, so we're going to add a second question pool. This one is going to be section two. I'm again going to get 10. Each one is going to be worth two points. And I'm going to browse my question library again. So. Last time I showed you how to get to it from that top right side from the source. This time I'm going to show you how to do it from this main, the main categories right here. So you can expand the sections that you've already created within your question library and then select the one that you're interested in adding. So I would like to, within this one, add chapter 12's questions into my question pool for this one. So I can click right on it. And if I want to see what's in there, you can click the arrow and it will actually show you all of the questions that are in that category. Um, so you can click here or you can use the source question to find the chapter that you want. It really is up to you what way makes the most sense to you. Um, so it has selected 43 questions. So I'm going to import those questions. Here we are again, it imports all of them, but 10 of the 43 will be randomly selected for this section. And then I'm gonna save it. So I'm good at this point. This is all I want for my quiz. So I'm gonna go back to my example one settings. And this is now my quiz. So I wanted to show you this so you can see how different a question pool looks in a, a quiz section. So it gives you section one, which for me, I think was chapter 11. Um, it gives you section one. So you'll want to name this what, whatever makes the most sense for you in terms of your students. Um, so if you want it to be that it's chapter one or chapter two or chapter 12 or whatever you want to name it, or you can just name it section one, whatever makes the most sense to you is totally fine. But section one has 10 from 52. And then here are my 10 random questions. I don't know what those questions are because it's set randomly for every single student. The same with section two, 10, 10 of 43, it's random for all of them. And as you can see, I have 20 questions. I said there were two points each. So we now have a 40 point 
assessment available for our students. So while we're on this page, before we go into a few other things, I wanted to show you a couple of other options and things to consider. So questions per page. Uh, if you are going to have a long assessment, um, and by long I mean more than like 10 or 15 questions, I'm going to encourage you to do questions <clears throat> per page. Um, if students are viewing this and you have them all on one page, they're just scrolling endlessly. Um, and they just have to keep scrolling and keep scrolling and keep scrolling. So you may want to consider having questions per page so that they can click the next button and not have quite so much on a page. Uh, so I'm going to do mine five questions per page and I'm going to apply. Uh, so what happens when you apply your questions per page is that a little line shows up after the fifth question. Um, so within this, this one is five questions per page from this section, and it's these five random questions. There is also the option to prevent moving backwards through pages. I personally don't turn that on. Um, I am a believer in the go through and answer all the ones that you feel comfortable with and then go back again to the beginning and answer the ones that you had a hard time with. Um, but if you are concerned about people going back and forth or sharing, as I, uh, Psychology 1410 might be, uh, you may want to prevent moving backwards through pages. Um, so if that is the case and you are very concerned about that, go ahead and turn on the prevent moving backwards through pages. So they will get five questions for this page. And when they're done with those five questions, they go to the next one. If they don't answer something of those five, they can't go back to it. It's done. It, they cannot go back to those five questions, it's set. So they just have to go to the next section. So they have to be a lot more aware of their time. They have to be a lot more aware of how they're spending their time and moving forward through the test. Uh, you can also shuffle again, um, and that will allow additional shuffles within your, um, within your quiz. So I think we're shuffling like five times at this point. So that's creating quite a bit of additional shuffling. Um, I add this extra tidbit uh, in every conversation I have with anybody about quizzes um, in your description or introduction, uh, both or either is fine. Um, make sure that you are adding a couple of pretty important statements. If your quiz is um, timed and it is timed for longer than about a half an hour, um, Make sure that you are putting a statement in here about not logging in to take the quiz through pipeline. Pipeline times out, your students will lose their quiz. Please encourage them to either go to the elearn.mtsu.edu or to the D2L quick links on the mtsu.edu webpage so that their quiz does not time out. If pipeline times out and they logged in through through pipeline to get to D2L, it can log them out and then their quiz is gone and you have to do a lot of manual behind the scenes to get that set or even reset their attempt um, because they don't necessarily know that they're logged out until they go to save and submit. So know that. And that leads to the second point. Please remind them to submit. If they do not submit the quiz, it doesn't auto grade. You can't see it unless you do some crazy stuff behind the scene to get it to push. Um, just make sure that they submit so that they can see it because if they don't, you can't see it, they can't see it. It impacts the attempts. Just remind them to attempt. So those are my two little steps for that that I wanted to, I throw that in every time I talk about quizzes. So those are the two big ones with that. Um, some additional restrictions for you to consider is down here at the bottom under optional advanced properties. Um, so if people are sitting in the room with each other um, and they're taking it at the same time, now A, they're all getting different questions in different order with different answers in those different orders. So it's going to be a little bit hard for them to make sure that they're going through this together if we're already at that point. But also, I, it might not be a bad idea for you to disable right click. This doesn't necessarily apply if your if the mouse doesn't have a right click option, um, but disable right click prevents the student from being able to do when they highlight something and then they right click and it says search Google for advanced. 
if you turn on, right, there you go. <laughs> um, so if you turn off right click, if you disable right click, they can't do that. Um, it prevents that from happening in the quiz. So that is that is a, a simple little spot that you can kind of put in there to help with that. So um, is that for Mac also or laptop where there can, does that prevent it? Because there's no right click on a laptop anyway. Uh, my My laptop has a right click. Are you talking about like if they're using the screen, like if it's a touch yeah. screen? Yeah, if they don't have a mouse, how are they right clicking? Yeah, it's not all encompassing. So it wouldn't apply to Apple? Uh, That's what, what I'm asking. Well, if you have a, a Mac and you're using a Mac and it's not a touch screen, then you don't have the right click option anyway. So it really is to prevent, and the only time that it would be different is if you have the if it's a touch screen and they are able to do it. But I think even with the touch screen, when you go to tap it, it acts like it's a right click. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a Mac, so we'll have to ask somebody and we'll check back on that and we can get back to you. Um, but I do know it can help with that. It's, a, it's one step. Does that help answer your question? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. as far as, yeah. Okay. Um, so the next level of uh, restrictions that we're going to talk about um, is a little bit about time. I hope that y'all already know about time and setting times. Um, so due dates, availability, and end dates. Just note that with end date, it's closed. With due date, it's when it's due. Um, so just that's the that's the big difference with that. Um, making sure that you are actually using the enforced time limit. The enforced time limit, if you normally give them uh, 15 minutes to take a quiz in a face-to-face -face class, why would you give them 120 minutes in an online class? Um, so give them the same 15 minutes and give them a one minute grace period. Um, or if it really is a two hour class, go ahead and give them the two hours. Um, but do it the same way you would have normally done it during a class time if you were meeting in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, and then, this next one I think is pretty important. So allow the student to continue working. So allowing the student to continue working, it'll give you a flag that they kept working, but it really just means the time limit didn't apply. Um, the one I typically use is prevent the student from making further changes. So when they hit that time limit, it stops. They cannot continue making changes. All they can do is submit. Um, or the third one, um, allow the student to continue working, but automatically score the attempt as zero after an extended deadline. So you would allow them to keep going, but after a minute, if they are still trying to keep going, they'll just get a zero on their exam. Um, so that's what those mean. And then special access, these down here typically refer to uh, when you are working with students that have uh, ADA accommodations. So uh, if they need additional time or additional resources, this is where you can give individual student access with that. Um, so, we have now created this quiz. We've put all kinds of fun stuff into it, um, and it is ready for us to go. It is ready for us to release it to our students. Um, so, now that that exists, and it is right down here, um, if you need to go back and look at it and review it, you simply just click on it. It will take you right back there. Um, so, the one other thing I, I want to show y'all um, is in how to reset attempts um, and publish your feed. But before I do that, what kind of questions do y'all have? Because we've still got a little bit of time before I get that. But what kind of questions do y'all have about question pools um, or the arithmetic questions um, or the question library? Oh, one more thing before I answer those questions. Um, if you have already created your quiz or your quizzes for all of your courses in the quiz tool, um, you can go into your um, question library and import the other direction. So that's an important note. We had somebody last week that had had lost some information, something didn't save and it was gone. Um, so I did want to show you very quickly how to do that. Um, so we're going to click on that exam one section that we created. So our the section that we created or the folder that we created at the beginning, we're going to click on import 
and then you're going to click on browse existing questions and that is going to pop up all of the quizzes or surveys that you already have in your class and you can then go in and select the one that you want to pull in and it will pull all of those questions over so it's okay if you um, did not create your question library to begin with, if you created your questions directly in your quiz, I strongly encourage you to pull them into your question library because then you can also make changes to them and manipulate them and copy that over to your future classes. And it will allow you to continue adding questions as you go and then create a more robust question pool the next time you offer the test or the assessment. Um, so we'll pick one um, and we will just pull, I'm just gonna use the one that we're on, um, which is, it happens to be the academic integrity survey, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and use that one and I'm gonna pull those questions in so that you can see what that looks like. So you simply select them for the quiz that you want and then you push import. And those questions now exist in my question library exam one. Um, so I'm going to show you one more just to show you that it, you can add them from anywhere to any section to any anything. You can add them in multiple places. So I'm going to go ahead and add one more. So we're going to browse existing again. And I am going to change it to my um, service excellence quiz that's in here. So this shows that they're already imported, um, which means we already put them someplace else. <clears throat> And so it's not going to let me do it, but what I need to find one that hasn't been imported. So I bet this one. Yep. So here's one that hasn't been imported. So I'm going to go ahead and import those and show you what that looks like. So we now have 25 ish questions in here that we would be able to create a new question pool based on this information. So if we had had um, our midterm from this semester and we wanted to pull all those questions and put them in our question library then next semester when we have our midterm again we can use it as a question pool and create and pull a variation of questions for our students so even if it's some of the same questions it's not going to come in the same order they're not going to come with the same answers they're not going to come with the same information so we're just creating a greater diversity of questions and quiz questions so um, does anybody have any questions or anything before I show y'all uh, the other aspects? Kim, is there any way to see where the, the question is? For example, if I've got a question in unit one and it's also in exam one, is there some way I can know all the different places that question is? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so... It is in, I gotta move y'all. Y'all are right in my way. Um, it is in, is it in settings? No. Um, I think it's in, let me play with that and I'll get back to you. It's, it's in the question itself. If you click on it, it will display what, uh, uh, what uh, pools it's existing. Oh, uh, there you go. Thank you. I don't get asked that question a lot, so. There you go. Um, no, that's not, that didn't help me. We'll play with it. We'll let you know. I'll um, send it out. Go to the question library. In the, in the question library, uh, if you will uh, look at it. Oh, yes, in here. That's where it does it. <laughs> yes, it's in here. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it will tell you where all it's located in the question library. So, um, but there's your question. Um, and then it will tell you in the, when you pull up the information, it'll show you. Does that help? Okay, now where is it? I see edit. Oh, sorry. Preview yeah. attempts. Yeah. And where was it? Where did you click on after that? Uh, 
Uh, I know that's edit. Sorry. Um, it is in attempts. No. I don't remember. Uh, no, that's not it either. It shows you where it is when it's in that one. Um, I'm going to have to look at that and get back to you on it to make sure that I know exactly which one, which settings you need to click to see it. Okay, thanks. Yep. Maybe under preview. Yeah, I think it may be. Can it be? If All you, right. What other questions do y'all have? If you go in a preview on the very bottom, it will be listed all of the places. Oh, uh, is that where it is? I don't do this often, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah thanks. I found it. Thanks. Yeah. Under preview. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Huh. So it tells you everywhere it shows up when you do that. But you got to use the question library to do that. Um, and it'll show you every quiz that it's been used in or location that it's been used. What other questions do y'all have? Actually, if you, if in the in single quiz, you will try to make any kind of correction, it will show you every way it was used as well. And it will ask you if you want to make a correction everywhere or just in one quiz. Yeah. Oh yeah, it will do that, which is fantastic. That, when you go to edit, if it's other places, it will it will ask you if you want to change it everywhere, which is nice because then you don't have to go in and manually change it in every location. I tend to change my questions in my question library um, and not my quiz itself um, so that because I usually find out that it's messed up after a quiz was taken. So <laughs> that doesn't that's after the fact so it doesn't help me a whole lot to change it in that quiz so i tend to change all of my questions in my question library so that from that point on when they uh when i copy over to another semester uh i know that it's correct in my question library what other questions y'all have before i show y'all a little bit about how to reset an attempt um and to push feedback Anybody have any questions about either of those? Anything? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I don't, this is where we're going to find out if I have, oh, look, somebody took this one. Um, so to uh, look at the pushing feedback and um, attempts reset from your quizzes, you will click on the arrow to the right of the name of the quiz and then click on grade. Grade. Uh-huh. Um, and so this is what shows up when you click on grade from the arrow next to the quiz. Um, <clears throat> successfully in August, I apparently got 100% on the syllabus quiz that I made up and took. Um, so this is where, uh, this is what this information will look like. This is where you can export information about attempts, which is kind of nice um, if you have questions. You can export the detailed information if you need that as either a CSV or an Excel. So if you are trying to look at some um, statistics on how students did on certain types of questions, if you're trying to determine if there is a, a certain area of questions or information that students are struggling with more than others, uh, something like that might be able to help you because you could really review some of that. Um, so this is where it is based on users. Um, and if you'll notice, um, I, I don't even know how often any of you have ever even been to this page, um, but what you have right down here are a reset, a publish feedback, and retract feedback. Um, so I'm going to show you how to publish feedback, um, which if you have a quiz that you have, uh, or an exam or test, that you've gone in and you've done all the feedback and you've saved it on everybody's and you come and look and it doesn't look like it's happening. Um, if you come in here and you click this button in the upper left-hand corner, it, if there were lots of students in my class, it would highlight every single student. Uh, when you click this little button, it highlights every single student that had completed that. And then you publish feedback. 
It tells you that we'll receive feedback on publishing. Do I want to continue? Yes. And that is when it sends the information and lets them know that they have um, gotten feedback on the exam. Um, so it, I was going to say it should probably, but I'm not, it does weird things when you're, I have multiple personalities, so sometimes it doesn't push to the right person. Um, so that is how you publish feedback. At that point, if I came in and I looked at my feedback, it would show that I had received it, um, that I read it. So, um, <clears throat> so does that mean when we're saving, um, when we're giving feedback per question in the quizzes, all this time, when we save at the end, does that mean it's not going to the students? Um, part of that depends on what your settings are in your quiz setting. So you may, it, it should, but if you have students saying, I don't see my feedback, I'm not getting my feedback from this quiz, the easiest way to fix that, because it may just be that there's a setting somewhere in your quiz that isn't turned on for automatic, uh, the automatic export. Um, so if you are getting feedback from your students or you're seeing that none of them have gone in and looked at their feedback, go ahead and come in and click this button and push the publish feedback and it will shoot it out to them again um, and let them know that they got it. Kim, what will that feedback consist of? Um, the information that you put in. So it's just the part that you put in as the feedback um, and then their grade. Um, it's not the submission view, which we'll talk about briefly if we get a chance here in a second, but that's what we're gonna talk about in two weeks is that submission view and specific feedback. That is very different from this. This is just their feedback on the actual grade and quiz. It's not the questions, it's not the answers, it's the the right. feedback that you physically put in there. Okay, so now that we know how to push our feedback, just in case, I'm gonna show you how to reset. So if you have somebody that messed up and they used pipeline to take their test and you, and that timed out and they couldn't submit and you are willing to let them retake the assessment, you would simply go in and click the check mark next to attempt one and then hit reset. It's going to tell you that once you have done this, you cannot undo it. So are you sure you want to do it? So make sure that you are only resetting the one person that you are wanting to reset. Because if you click that button up that was at the top and highlights everybody and then you hit reset, you have just erased everybody else's quiz. So mm -hmm. just make sure you're clicking on that one quiz that you need to reset. When this button pops up, you click yes, I now no longer have an attempt in this class because I was the only one that had had, had attempted anything. I, there's no longer an attempt um, because I have retracted it, which means if I only had one attempt to take the test, I can now go back and retake it because I have my attempt has been reset. Um, so I want to show you that because that's actually um, those two, the published feedback and the reset are the things that we've actually gotten a lot of questions about in the last couple of weeks. And my guess is that's because of midterms. Um, but that people are running into some situations with that. So I uh, wanted to make sure to show y'all how to do that. Hey, Kim, could you go over that one more time? Sure. So from Manage Quizzes, um, we are going to, uh, I don't think I have a quiz that anybody's taken. Um, so... Yeah, I don't have a quiz that anybody's taken. So hang on just a, just a second. I got to find one that somebody's taken. Um, let's see. taking my quiz real quick. <laughs> At least it's a short test, right? It won't take me very long to take it. Uh, I'm actually not a student at MTSU. <laughs> okay, so submitted my quiz. 
submit it again so that it actually submits so that it exists and it's there. So this is my default submission view. This is all it tells me because I don't have any additional submission view set. So, um, so I attempted um, my highest attempt. So I clearly only got a 50% on this because I'm not a student. <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so for a quiz, we are going to go back to that. We're going to click grade, click that arrow next to the one that's been taken, click grade, and it takes us right back to this page. Um, so I did really badly on this test, that whole I'm not a student at MTSU. Um, so if I want to reset this test, and allow a student to take it over again, you click this button next to attempt one, and then click the little trash can that says reset. It pops up a reminder to make sure you really wanna do it because it's permanent, it's gone forever. And then you click yes, and the attempt is gone like it never existed. Um, so that is how you reset an attempt in case you ever have that. Sometimes. Um, I've had to reset them before when someone has started a quiz um, and then realized they really didn't have time to take it and you get in there and you see that they didn't, they started it and four seconds later they logged <laughs> out um, and I've allowed them to go back in and retake it. Um, but it, it's up to you when you're going to need to use that. But if you ever need to use it, that's where to find it and that's how to reset a quiz. Uh, Kim, actually, you can restore what you deleted with reset it. Uh, I, I did it. I, I accidentally removed, uh, you know, reset yeah. students. There, there are some ways to do it, but it's way better to tell yourself you can't and don't do it than it is to try to go in and restore something that you deleted. It takes a lot. You got to go in behind the scenes to restore things. Um, so just try, try real hard when you reset something that you make sure you're resetting the right one because it, it's pretty scary in that moment of you trying to figure out how to refine it. But you can, it's just not, it's not easy. And uh, the other way I did it uh, was going back into the restrictions and you know, where you can add, like you were saying the ADA compliance, because I wanted it to keep the one attempt, but yeah. I allowed a student to have another attempt because they said they'd had a issue with their internet. And yep. so I wanted it to be, so I just went in and gave them, and it's also because I had restrictions of like what time frame they had to take it and it had passed that time frame. Yep. So I out a second attempt and also gave them a, the, the, a new time frame. Yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, that is one of the, the other options with that. I mean, in the restrictions under the special access, um, I know I mentioned that it was mostly for ADA, but it also is for that. If you have something happen that you want to allow somebody to come in and add an extra time, you can add uh, users to special access and then you can change their due date. You can change the end date. You can change the amount of time and you can add an extra attempt um, if you would like to. Um, so this would allow them to have an additional attempt. Um, and it does ask if you want some advanced with that, like in order to get a second attempt, you had to have a minimum of this many points or a maximum of this many points on, on attempt one. It's up to you if you want to be able to, to do that. Um, I, I leave it blank. I'm just allowing them to retake it. But if you have something that says you will allow a student to retake a test if they got a 50 or a 60 or, um, or if you're using, um, that they can take it as many times as they want until they get 100 if you're using it for formative purposes, then you could set it so that they can continue having attempts until they reach 100%. Um, so that, those are definitely ways that you can add and give additional options. When I set up my uh, quizzes, I set them up for automatic export to grades, mm -hmm. um, but my students are telling me that they're not able to see their quiz grades in the grade book. Uh, I can see them, but they cannot. I feel like there's something somewhere that I didn't click, uh, but I've used this previous semesters and not had that issue, so I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. I, I expect it's simple, but but I messed it up somewhere. <laughs> um, and it, <laughs> it's in the... Um, they they can't see it, but it has a, it's set to automatic export. Your eyeballs are probably still closed. I know that sounds weird, but that's how you can tell the difference. 
in the um, grade. Mm -hmm. So but, it's possible in your grade book that your grade is hidden? Mm -hmm. if, the, if, if, if the eyes are shut, then they can't see it, you can. Okay, so how do I, how do I fix that? <laughs> I know so what you're talking about. In, your, um, in grades, check in grades um, and go to manage grades. Okay. So you got inner grades, which is where everybody's name and all the stuff is going to be, but then right. click on manage grades. Okay. And make, make sure the grade doesn't have, it's like my midterm has an eyeball. Okay. It means it's not available. Okay. Um, this was our showing people how to create midterm exams. I mean, midterm calculated. So you didn't have to do the math yourself. So okay. So then I would just click on that eyeball and open it. And that would, uh, you have to do, uh, you have to click on the arrow make visible to user. and make visible to user. Hmm. Okay. I bet that's it. Oh boy. Thank you. That, that might be what it is. Um, if not go in and just publish the feedback, um, on that publish feedback page that, that I showed y'all. Okay. Um, and that should push it to them. Okay. Um, it, if it's the eyeball, that's probably what the issue is, but it never hurts to publish feedback again to make sure it gets there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, it, it's 12.35, so um, we are we are here to stay and answer questions. I just wanted to let people know in case anybody needed anything. So, um, and I, I'm probably gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Um, and stop my screen share and stop recording. So, um, but we can keep answering questions as long as you all would like. Related questions.